Hello, and thank you for joining us for our webinar, 2024 Illinois Employment Law Update, a year in review in the year ahead. My name is Gary Clark. I'm a partner in Coral's Chicago office, specializing in all aspects of labor and employment, uh, including employment litigation. Also presenting today is Caitlin Phillips, an attorney in our Chicago office who likewise specializes in labor and employment law and handling issues and advising and counseling employers. We'll begin the presentation as soon as we cover a few logistic items. Uh, first, all comments in today's webinar are off the record and not for publication. All attendees are in listen-only mode, but we welcome your questions via the Q&A box located below the slides in the webinar dashboard. If we don't have time to answer all questions during the webinar, we'll follow up over email. After the program, Quarles will apply for one hour of general continuing legal education credit in U.S. jurisdictions where applicable. Quarles certifies that this activity has been approved for California participatory MCLE credits by the State Bar of California in the amount of up to one general credit. Quarles is a State Bar of California MCLE approved provider. Participants seeking CLE credit must be logged in participating from their own device and must complete the electronic CLE form provided in the resources box. Please include in the attendance verification code that will be announced during the presentation. Regardless of which jurisdiction you are licensed in, Quarles will only provide CLE credit to those who return the form with the proper code. Please take a moment to review the resources box below the video feed where you'll find a copy of today's presentation, a survey link to share your feedback, and the electronic CLE form. You can access closed captioning during the live webinar by clicking on the CC icon in the lower right-hand corner of the video player. Today's webinar is being recorded. All registrants will receive the on-demand link within a few days. And with that, let's get started. Um, as many of you know, some of you are in Illinois, some of you are outside of Illinois, but Illinois, we've really become a, uh, a headache for a lot of employers recently with a lot of new laws that have come on the books in 22, 23, and now 24 uh, that are making life difficult for employers with Illinois employees. One of the things we want to talk about today is kind of highlighting some of the more recent amendments some recent laws and changes in that regard, and, and even some old laws that are somehow getting a new life that was unforeseen even a year ago. With that, I will turn this over to Caitlin. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. You can see, as, as Gary mentioned here, just a brief outline of some of the topics that we're gonna discuss today. But we are going to kick it off with the Illinois Paid Leave for All Workers Act. Um, funny enough, the act was actually signed into law a year ago today. So happy anniversary, everyone. Um, but it went into effect as of January 1 of this year. Um, in broad terms, the act provides for paid time off to all Illinois employees, which has caused a significant stir among some of our Illinois clients here. Uh, or people who have employees within Illinois, as many either don't have PTO policies for their employees, or they don't have policies that necessarily comply with the requirements of the act. So we're gonna dive into some of the details so you can get a sense of what this act actually requires. Um, to start, it's important to note that the act does not include what we've been, or does include, excuse me, what we've been referring to as a grandfather provision which allows employers who have existing PTO policies that are compliant with really the three remaining bullet points that you'll see on this slide here to keep their pre-existing policies as is and not make any additional uh, changes. The caveat to that being, if the policy was in effect as of January 1, so as January 1 of this year, then you can take advantage of this sort of grandfathered provision. Um, if not, then we're talking about amending your policies to make sure it complies with all components of the act. Um, so if you look at your current policy, you're not in compliance with these three bullet points here. You are looking at revamping your PTO policy so that it complies with the other elements of the law. Uh, so what are some of those key requirements that you need to meet in order to grandfather your current policy? 
Um, the first being that the policy must be applicable to all full-time, part-time, and seasonal employees. This is one that's often a big shift for employers because we're seeing quite a few PTO policies that are either only applicable to full-time employees um, and not to also their seasonal or their part-time employees. So your policy really needs to cover all of your workforce um, with some few minor exceptions. Uh, second, the leave can be used for any reason, meaning that there are no restrictions or limitations put on why an employee can use the leave. Um, when evaluating your policy, the question becomes not only does your policy say explicitly that it can be used for any reason or more likely whether it you know, doesn't mention any restrictions at all on use, um, that's a good start. Uh, but also how does your policy operate in practice? So for example, if under your current policy, you require that employees schedule all of their PTO for the following year by December 31st, uh, then in practice, your policy doesn't allow employees to use their PTO to cover a day that they might need, for example, to stay home with a sick child or if they get a flat tire on the way to work. Um, so this is something to look out for as well. Um, and, and really keying in on your own policies as you're doing that evaluation. And lastly, the policy must provide at least 40 hours of paid leave during a 12 month period. And as you'll see on this slide, this can be done with what we call front loading or giving an employee their entire bank of paid leave up front, either at the beginning of when they're hired or at the start of your benefit year, or you can allow employees to accrue their paid leave over time, meaning for every you know, certain number of hours that they work, they earn a specific portion of their paid leave entitlement. Uh, under the act, under PLAWA, the minimum accrual rate is one hour of paid leave must be earned for every 40 hours that an employee works. So as you're looking at your policies, if you think you hit all three of those, there's a potential that you might be able to, to grandfather your policy in. Um, again, we recommend, you know, having someone take a look at that to confirm um, but something to look out for as you're evaluating your policies going forward. Caitlin, we have a question that came in. And again, I want to encourage everybody to ask questions because it makes us a lot better for all of us, especially as speakers. The question we've got is if you're an employer outside of Illinois, but you have someone working remotely in Illinois, do you have to provide this paid leave? Yes, it does cover all employees. So even if you are outside of Illinois, but you have employees who are performing work within Illinois, um, then we highly recommend considering, for example, an addendum to an employee handbook. Um, if you're uh, providing that paid leave that you're making sure that that employee gets covered. Great question. Now we'll jump to kind of some of the other key details of the act that you would be required to incorporate into your paid leave policy if you aren't eligible for the grandfathering provision. So if you're creating an entirely PLAWA compliant policy, what are some of the other elements that you must include? Um, in terms of notice by the employee to the employer, you can require seven days of calendar notice for foreseeable leave. And for unforeseeable leave, you can require that the employee provide notice as soon as practicable. practicable. Um, one of the interesting nuances of the law and the way it's drafted is on the previous, previous slide, you may have noticed that under the bullet point outlining that employees are entitled to use the paid leave for any reason, um, that employers cannot inquire about why an employee is taking leave, and they can also not require that the employee submit any type of documentation or certification to support their need for leave. Um, so it's almost a, a no questions asked. They tell you that they need to use the leave, um, and employers really must be hands off at that point. Uh, what this means in practice is that the act doesn't really give employers any mechanism for assessing whether or not an employee's need for leave was foreseeable versus unforeseeable. Um, because they simply can't ask. So something to keep in mind in practice that that's kind of how this plays out, um, though your policy can include those requirements on the amount of notice that must be required. Next, you'll see that the employer is allowed to impose a 90 day waiting period for employees to become eligible to use their paid leave. Um, this prevents you know, a, a new hire employee from trying to use all their paid leave right up front. Um, and you can also incorporate into your policy certain circumstances under which paid leave requests may be denied. 
um, and those must be for operational necessity. So, you know, think of things like influxes and leave requests that come right around the holidays. Um, that might be a reason that you need to request or to de deny requests for leave um, to avoid having kind of a, a, you know, a, a minimized workforce around the holidays. If your company has peak or busy seasons that, you know, that need to be accounted for, and you really need all hands on deck, Again, it might be another uh, circumstance under which you might need to deny a leave request. The important thing being is to make sure that your policy clearly articulates these scenarios in the policy so it's clear that the employee um, you know, might run into one of these circumstances where their leave could be denied. And then lastly, how about payout upon separation? I know this is often a big question. Um, the key here is whether your paid leave that you're providing pursuant to the act is incorporated into your pre-existing PTO or vacation policies, or if it's kept separate. Um, one way to evaluate that is whether or not you track your plow leave in the same way, you know, in your tracking system as you are your vacation leave or your other PTO. Um, if it's tracked separately, you do not have to pay out upon separation. If it's all thrown into the same bucket, then payout is likely required. Um, and as you know, you become subject now to payout requirements under the Illinois Wage Payment and Collection Act for earned vacation as well. Um, importantly, here, because the law is so new, there is still lack of clarity as to how we evaluate if payout is required, um, if leave is in the same bucket or if it's not. Um, we're still seeing guidance come out from that from the Illinois Department of Labor on, on how the act is actually applied. So. Um, you know, in fact, we're still operating under proposed rules. We actually don't have finalized rules, so we could see some more clarity come out on that in the future, but something important to keep in mind, and I know a question that a lot of our clients have. Now that you know some of the details kind of at a very high level, we just wanted to hit on kind of what are the most common issues that we're seeing when we advise clients on their paid leave policies and their compliance with PLAWA. Um, like I mentioned earlier, application to part-time and seasonal employees is a big one. This is the one where there's been kind of the most adjustment for a lot of employers that we work with who had policies that only apply to full-time employees. Um, we're now having to talk through, you know, if your policy is going to apply to part-time employees, what does that actually look like? Um, you know, if you're front-loading leave, do you want to accrue leave for your part-timers? Um, do you want to front load it for everyone? There's a lot of conversations that take place on how you want to craft a policy now that you're including part-time employees as well. Um, so that's really a big one that we're seeing um, that's causing a lot of discussions with our clients. The other is the two hour minimum increment requirement. So I hadn't mentioned this on the previous slides, but under the act, employers can set a reasonable minimum increment that the employee must use their paid leave when they request time off but it cannot exceed two hours. Um, so for our employers who require employees to make their request for either full or half days of leave, um, assuming we're operating under an eight hour workday, um, that would not be you know, compliant with the law. Um, if you're requiring them to take it in either four or eight hour increments, um, you really need to bump that down um, to two hours in order to be compliant with the act. And then hey, also, there, yeah. I was just say, if I can interrupt real quick, sorry. I, we have a question that says, is there a minimum number of hours that a seasonal or part-time employee must work to be covered by this? There is not. Um, there is not a minimum hour requirement. They are still entitled to earn up to that 40 hours like a full-time is. Um, and they are uh, you know, entitled to earn it at, at one hour for every 40 hours that's worked. Um, and there is no minimum requirement that they must work. So. Um, as long as they're working, as soon as they hit that 40 hours, they earn that one hour of leave and they'll continue to do so, um, even if they're not, you know, working maybe a traditional part-time, you know, 20 hours per week or what have you. Perfect. Okay. And then I would just say, I see we have another question at, about employees that live in Illinois and work in Iowa or Wisconsin or Indiana and are cross-border employees. And, and that's a fairly common issue, um, especially if the individual works remotely on occasion from Illinois. My advice always is you've got you've to sit down and take a look at that because you don't just make, pick and choose whether you're an Illinois employee for some laws but not others or Wisconsin employee for some laws or not others. You're sitting down and you're doing an analysis with your legal counsel 
about where is the, the tax withholding coming from? Where is that employee predominantly working from? And you're making a decision that they're an employee for one state is typically what you're, what you're doing, so. Yeah, great guidance there, Gary, and, and really wonderful question. Um, jumping back in, some of the other headaches that we've seen, you know, cause for empl um, employers under PLAWA, there are some notice and accounting requirements under the act, employers are obligated to track and document hours worked, paid leave that's been accrued and taken, any remaining leave balance, and that's for each employee. Um, this becomes tricky for employers with, you know, salaried exempt employees who don't clock in and out every day, um, you know, and who might just be operating under the assumption that they work 40 hours per week. Under the act, employers are technically obligated to be tracking all of the hours that these employees are working as well. There is no carve out for exempt employees. Thus, it's important to talk uh, again with kind of counsel about your risk that you might be taking if you're not tracking that time, um, which many, if not, you know, most employers do not track that time for their, their exempt employees, but just something to keep in mind that, you know, it, it to consider that it is technically a requirement under the act. Um, and then lastly, a big question we get is the interaction between PLAWA and the FMLA particularly when it comes to employers, um, you know, having their hands tied when it comes to asking an employee for why they're requesting time off, um, but also an employer's obligation to provide employees with, you know, an FMLA designation notice if they have reason to believe that the employee's plow leave might also be FMLA qualifying. Um, so we're gonna turn to a hypothetical to kind of walk through a practical circumstance where we might see this come up. Um, so the hypothetical we have here, Ron has called off work for three consecutive days and has requested to use plow leave for each day. Given the circumstances, HR representative Leslie suspects that Ron's absences may also be covered by the FMLA. Leslie would like to provide Ron with FMLA paperwork, but she's unsure if she's able to due to PLAWA's prohibition against asking employees for a reason for leave or documentation to support the leave. So the question is, is Leslie in violation of PLAWA if she provides Ron the FMLA paperwork? The answer here in the position that we take is no. Um, in order to ensure compliance with the FMLA, it is still a recommended practice to provide FMLA paperwork if you suspect that an employee may be absent due to an FMLA qualifying reason. Um, and this is because we view these as, as really two separate entitlements, You know, one from the state and then one from the federal government. Um, the key being you should communicate to the employee that returning the FMLA paperwork is voluntarily is voluntary and will not impact the employee's use of PLAWA leave. Um, in other words, you should not be denying their request for PLAWA leave if they don't submit the FMLA pa paperwork back to you. Um, of course, an employee who has exhausted their PLAWA leave, you are entitled to request information about their reason for leave or supporting documentation. Um, but something to be careful of is sort of you navigate the interplay between the two of them is that you just want to make sure that any request for documentation is not impacting their ability to use that leave. Now, um, in addition to the Illinois Paid Leave Act that we saw statewide, um, many did not realize that right at the end of the year, both Cook County and Chicago snuck in some changes to their own paid leave ordin ordinances that have also caused a stir among employers. So we're gonna take a look at those now here briefly as well. Um, we'll start by looking at Cook County. Um, so what Cook County did is eliminate what was previously their earned sick leave ordinance, which granted leave to employees um, who could demonstrate that they needed the leave for specific qualifying reasons, you know, tied to illnesses or sicknesses or medical care that they needed. Um, and they replace that with what is essentially, you know, kind of mirroring what Illinois PLAWA does um, and applying that to Cook County as well with some minor differences. So we'll talk about those. Um, the ordinance went into effect December 31st and enforcement is was set to begin and has set to begin on February 1st of this year. Um, so again, very new requirements. Not a lot of employers picked this up because they snuck it in, like I said, right at the end of the year. Um, as people were gearing up for the holidays and, and looking forward to 2024 already. Um, so some key things to consider if you have employees who are located in Cook County. 
We'll start first with with in which ways that it is similar. Um, so you can see by the chart here, it, it really does mirror, you know, the Illinois statewide act, which is the good news. Um, it has the same accrual rates and caps. It allows front loading, um, same minimum use requirements and advance notice requirements. Uh, you cannot request an explanation or documentation, just as with PLAWA. Um, you can use a pre-existing policy um, if it is compliant with the ordinance, um, similar with PLAWA, and it does not require payout upon separation. Um, so a lot of ways in which it is similar, which like I mentioned is, is good news for those who might have employees who are both working in Cook County, but also in other areas of the state as well. Um, now, there are a few ways that it is different that we just want to quickly note for you all and, and to keep in mind, um, you know, they're under PLOWA, there are a few exceptions to employees who are, um, you know, who fall under the requirement of the act, which you can see here, for example, temporary employees who are college students and working on college campuses, you know, exempt from the act, uh, the Cook County ordinance contemplates some of those exceptions as well. However, it does not include an exception for employees covered by a CBA who provide national and international freight and delivery services, um, such as PLAWA does. So minor distinction there might not be applicable to, to many of you on the call, but something important to note. Um, and then the Cook County Court Ordinance also does not include a provision allowing employers to deny a request for leave like PLAWA does. Um, but as I mentioned, this is still in its infancy. It's still going through the rulemaking stage. So we very likely could see that forthcoming, but just note that as it's currently drafted, um, that uh, you know, ability on behalf of employers to deny those requests doesn't currently exist. And then a couple other differences, just some minor differences in employer notice requirements, as you'll see here, um, there's no pay stub accounting requirement as of now, again, still in development here. Um, but something to note, as well as there's a difference in civil damages that are calculated um, for violations under PLAWA versus the Cook County Paid Leave Ordinance. So um, something to keep in mind as well is that you could see differences there and um, what sort of penalties that you might be seeing if you're in violation of either the act or the ordinance. Now we'll take a look at Chicago. Um, Chicago has implemented what is called the Chicago Paid Leave and Paid Sick and Safe Leave Ordinance. By the, the length of the title alone, you can probably tell that their requirements are a bit more extensive than under PLAWA or under the Cook County Ordinance. So we'll take a brief look at those as well. Um, first, when we talk about implementation of the ordinance, it does not go into effect until July 1 of this year. Um, so this one actually is still forthcoming. Uh, you can see the employees who are covered under the ordinance and it's based on you know, how many hours that they are working within a specific time period within the city of Chicago. Um, and the key difference here is going to be the employee entitlement. So not only do employees receive 40 hours of paid leave, which they are entitled to under the current paid sick leave ordinance, they'll get 40 hours of that paid sick leave, um, but they also get an additional 40 hours of paid leave that they can use for any reason. So we're talking about a total of 80 hours per year for employees who are working in Chicago. Um, there is also a difference in the accrual rate if you're implementing that kind of route, um, which is one hour for every 35 hours worked, not the one in 40 like we were talking about under Plowa and Cook County. So um, just enough of, enough of a difference to make you have to think about it and, and evaluate it when you're talking about your policies for your Chicago employees. Um, but there is still that option to front load um, like you have under the statewide act and also in Cook County. Some of the highlights of the ordinance, just very briefly here, there are carryover requirements if you're utilizing that accrual method, which you can see here. Um, they are different for whether it's paid sick leave or just paid leave generally. There's also guidance for payout upon separation. Um, no payout requirement for sick leave time that is earned, but there is a payout for the paid leave that an employee is entitled to, which you can see here is based on the size of the employer. Um, it's important to note that this ordinance is also in its infancy. So there are some discrepancies between the language of the act, um, the proposed rules, the guidance we're receiving from the city, particularly as it relates to the amount of payout that's required. 
Um, so we just recommend before implementing any policy changes in anticipation of you know the summer enforcement date to just confirm if there's been any developments on that front. Um, and then you'll see here that employers can invoke different waiting periods for employees to become eligible to use their leave. It's going to be 30 days for that sick leave um, and then the same 90 days for that paid leave that we're seeing in the rest of the state and also in Cook County. And with that, we will shift from paid leave and we'll talk a little bit more about the Illinois Equal Pay Act amendments. And we're gonna start with the Equal Pay Registration Certificate requirement. Um, many of you may have been dealing with this last year, uh, but with the deadline fast approaching, we thought we'd mention it during today's presentation as well. Um, under the Illinois EPA, private employers with 100 or more employees must obtain a registration certificate from the Department of Labor by March 23rd, 2024. So we're talking about 10 days from now, um, and then employers must recertify every two years. Um, there is also an obligation to submit an enrollment form on the IDOL's website, which just acknowledges that you are a, you know, responsible to comply with the requirements. This is really how the IDOL knows to send you a notice and deadline to apply, uh, which you will see here in the last bullet. Um, importantly, if you did not receive a notice from the IDOL, uh, but you are still required to complete the submission by the deadline if you are a covered employer. Uh, thus, you know, kind of ignoring the enrollment form or trying to evade receiving notice from the IDOL, unfortunately, will not save you from the paperwork that's required from, from submitting your application, but wanted to make sure to note that for you. Um, if you haven't received this notice, but you think you could potentially be a covered employer under the act, it's gonna be important to really look into that. And just briefly here, you can see what's actually in the application or what you're required to disclose to the IDOL to get that registration certificate. Um, you must submit a compliance certificate and there's sample forms available on the IDOL's website. Essentially, you're attesting that you're compliant with various Illinois and federal employment laws um, that there aren't any discrepancies in compensation based on protected characteristics, among other things. So um, you can dig around and take a look at that on the IDOL's website of what they expect to be included in those statements. Uh, you are also required to submit employee compensation data, uh, which you can see what that includes below. I've listed out here all of that information that you have to collect on each of your employees and submit to the IDOL. Um, so it is a little bit of an undertaking to make sure you've got all that data compiled and ready to go. And then there is also a filing fee. And so again, this just really serves as a reminder, if you think you might be a covered employer, you should be looking into your obligation to submit an application if you haven't already, um, and on somewhat of an urgent basis, just giving that impending deadline. So worth um, you know, looking into that if you haven't already and wanted to flag that for you all, even though, again, it has been a requirement now um, that existed in 2023 as well. Caitlin, we've uh, we've got about 10 questions all asking, what if you have more than 100 employees, but you know, what are we looking at? The number of employees, and this is for the Equal Pay Act, for the Cook County and Chicago uh, earned sick leave laws. Questions people are asking, what if I have more than 100 employees? Am I looking at the number that I have in Chicago or Cook County? Um, to determine whether these provisions apply to me under the Equal Pay Act. Are we counting all my employees nationwide or just my Illinois employees? Can you, do you have a, any advice to give on that? Yeah, it's a great question and it's going to vary obviously from act to act if we're talking about the Equal Pay Act versus the Cook County Ordinance or Chicago Ordinance. Um, there are some various nuances to each of those. So I would recommend um, that definitely be something if you think you're on the bubble there, you are in a situation where you might have the total amount of employees, but you only have a few who are working in certain jurisdictions that may or may not be covered. Um, that's definitely something worth running by your counsel, um, you know, your Corals and Brady attorney and making sure that, that you are accurately calculating the employees that you must be looking at to evaluate whether or not you're actually a covered employer. Um, because it is kind of nuanced. In some instances, it depends on how often the employee is working within the jurisdiction. In others, it depends on, you know, are they physically residing there versus where are they actually performing their work? Um, it can change from act to act, and it is pretty detailed. So I'd recommend definitely reviewing that if you think you might be sort of on the bubble in any of those situations. Okay. 
Okay. And then lastly, just with respect to the Illinois Equal Pay Act, a more recent change that we wanted to highlight for you is the pay transparency requirement that has been added to the act, which doesn't go into effect until January 1 of next year. But we wanted to provide a very general preview, uh, you know, as you start to think about the impacts that this might have on you in 2025, um, you know, noting, of course, that, that we could see some changes to the requirements between now and then, but wanted to put this all on your radar because this will fast approach, um, you know, as, as many of you probably know, these, these types of things kind of quickly come up on you. So something we wanted to put on your radar to keep in the back of your mind. Um, to run briefly through the requirements, Illinois employers now with 15 employees or more must disclose either wages and salaries or wage and salary ranges, as well as a general description of benefits in all job postings. This means you know, that coming up in the near future, employers will need to start thinking about how to evaluate um, you know, forthcoming job postings they might have and making determinations about what's appropriate to include in terms of, of a wage or salary or a wage or salary range. Um, some things employers, you know, will need to start thinking about and factors to consider when determining an appropriate range. Um, you know, what's what's been the previously determined range for the position, uh, the actual range of other employees currently holding equivalent positions, uh, the budgeted amount for the position, any applicable pay scale. There's a lot of dynamics that could be at play um, when trying to determine what information you should actually include in a post. Um, so some things to start thinking about is that that could change um, the way you go about posting job openings going forward um, in 2025. And then you'll see here on the slide as well that it also imposes some requirements about postings for promotional opportunities as well. Um, you know, namely that internal postings must also be made and there's some timing requirements around those as well. And then just to, to wrap up with a few of more details, um, you know, what postings will be covered by the requirements? You have those who are performing their duties, at least in part in Illinois. Um, any of those positions will need to include this information as well as positions performed outside of Illinois, but who report to someone in Illinois, um, meaning that this captures those remote, remote positions as well. If an employee outside of Illinois can apply for the job and still perform the role, then the posting should include those pay disclosures. Um, note as well here that if you utilize third-party job posting platforms or vendors, you are obligated as the employer to provide them with the necessary information about pay and benefits. Otherwise, you as the employer will be li liable for non-compliance. Um, also a record-keeping requirement, meaning you must keep track of the pay scale and benefits for the positions that you're offering, as well as the job postings for each of those positions. Um, now, this is still so new here in Illinois, so we can only speculate as to how enforcement will go, but we have seen in other states who have pay transparency laws on the books, um, you know, and they've had them for longer periods of time, that their departments of labor are requesting this information from employers when claims are brought forward. So a key requirement to keep in mind that you really should be holding on to all of those, um, and I believe under the act, it's for three years. Um, so something to keep in mind as well. Uh, as you proceed forward in 2025, that you're gonna wanna start collecting and preserving those postings. And then lastly, there is a cure period for active postings provided to the employers, um, you know, before the IDO will start issuing fines. If you have an active posting that's non-compliant, you'll get an opportunity to cure. However, once an employee, you know, posting is pulled down, no longer active, employers will not receive the benefit of a cure period and will be subject to those fines, um, you know, if imposed by the IDOL. So, very quickly, just a highlight of what we'll see coming forward in 2025. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Gary. Great, thank you, Caitlin. One quick question we've got um, for you on the pay transparency. There's a question about, well, what if I really don't care where the person works or resides because it's a remote position and I advertise it nationally, do I need to comply with this? And I think, you know, I think the answer would if it's going to be anywhere, there's a lot of states right now that have very similar laws. Would you advise um, someone to be to complying kind of generally with what these pay transparency laws apply in multiple states? Do you have other thoughts? What do you what are you thinking? 
Yeah, I think there's a couple of preliminary questions. I think exactly what you mentioned, you know, where this employee is residing, do they also have pay transparency laws? As Gary mentioned, there's sort of a proliferation of these who, that's happening throughout the entire United States. Um, also, if the employee will be at all reporting to anyone in Illinois, um, you know, regardless of where they're located, then they would still be covered under the language of the act, even if it's sort of a, a national posting. So um, if you're an Illinois employer and you're posting that national position for someone to work remotely and you don't care where they're located, um, completely fine, but that posting should still include the pay transparency requirements and those disclosures there if they're going to at all be reporting to someone in Illinois. Okay, great. Thank you, Caitlin. Well, I've this is one of my favorite presentations, and, I, and Caitlin and I gave the same presentation last year uh, for a local organization, and we're doing the same again. And, and it's fun because it's a chance to sit and look at all these laws that sometimes we forget even exist, but yes, we have to be paying attention to them. Yes, we could get tricked. Uh, tripped up on them if we're not. Um, one of the first ones is is for Chicago. And the Chicago ban the box uh, law has been in place for a number of years. And it just generally uh, specifies when you can ask for an employee's conviction history and when you cannot. Well, that's now been amended. And there have been a couple really important amendments to it. One is that it now applies to all employers doing business in Chicago. So if you you have any employees, you're in Chicago, this covers you. It had previously only required at least 15 employees to apply. Um, it has a new individualized assessment requirement, which is gonna look somewhat familiar to sophisticated employers. And we'll talk about that in a second. New notice requirements. Um, it has an arrest record discrimination provision as well, which and a lot of these, it largely mirrors the amendments to Illinois Human Rights Act. Um, so it shouldn't change things too much, but where it's really gonna change things is for the employers uh, who, who these laws didn't apply to previously due to the number of employees. So let's talk about the new individualized assessment requirement. And we've had a form of this in place for a long time. It, for a long time when dealing with Title VII, um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has for a long time taken the position that you can't, you should not have categorical prohibitions on hiring people with convictions for specific positions. That's been in place for a long time. They have a standard that you have to meet in order to have a categorical prohibition. Um, you know, and the concern in the EEOC guidance is that they feel that categorical prohibitions on people with convictions disproportionately impact um, persons of color. And so that's why they have this guidance and why they take the position that it can constitute race or national origin discrimination. Um, EEOC has long been advocating that you've got to look at every position and every individual and their convictions individually in order to determine if you're going to uh, disqualify someone because of a conviction. And what we're now seeing is we're now seeing the Chicago law is basically codifying this. So this guidance from the EEOC that a lot of employers have been applying when they look at this is now actual law and an actual ordinance in Chicago. And what it says is an employer can rely upon a criminal conviction to determine an employee is ineligible for a job if Again, these two conditions are met. So what's the one thing this means? It means you cannot have a, a categorical prohibition on hiring people with convictions, right? Because you you're already in, not in compliance with the law. If you're going to disqualify someone or terminate them because you've learned about it, there has to be two, two factors met. One, there is, has to be a substantial relationship between the conviction and the job sought or held. And what's an example of that? You're hiring someone to work in your finance or accounting group, and you find out they have a, a felony conviction for embezzlement, right? That's pretty easy to draw that connection. You're not going to have a tough time saying there's a substantial relationship between that conviction and that job sought or held. Where might that get a little tricky? Well, if it, let's say it's a uh, marijuana consumption conviction prior to that becoming lawful in Illinois, and it's someone who's going to work in your finance group. Well, that's not an obvious one. You're going to have to look more closely to understand why you think that conviction disqualifies this individual. 
So what are you going to look at? Well, for the second one, based upon the nature of the offense, the employer believes the individual poses an unreasonable risk to property or the safety or welfare of specific individuals or the general public. And what would be examples of something that would probably meet this? And it's going to be different for every workplace. Um, but something that might meet this would be you find out that this applicant uh, is a convicted uh, multi-murderer and who's been out of jail for five days and is applying to work in your workplace. That might be a basis for arguing that you have concerns about uh, unreasonable risk to property. If the individual's an arsonist and burned down their, their last workplace, that's probably a pretty reasonable uh, risk that you might consider there. So when you look at this analysis though, you've got to also consider mitigating factors, right? So you're going to, and this is the same as the EEOC guidance. Most of this is straight from the EEOC almost. Uh, you've got to look at the temporal proximity of the conviction, right? Is this a conviction from when the individual is 18, they're now 40 and they've not had a single conviction or criminal problem in 22 years? That's going to be a mitigating factor. Or is it something from, you know, last year? Um, that's going to be one. The number of convictions in the individual's record, right? Is it one conviction or is this someone with a string of convictions uh, for felonies and other serious crimes? Their age at the time, their rehabilitation efforts, the nature and severity of the conviction, and its relationship to the safety and security of others. That was why we use that example of convicted murderer and the facts and cir uh, circumstances surrounding the conviction. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a quick pause to give you the number for the CLE. Uh, today's code for the CLE is 81577. Uh, please note the CLE code on your CLE form, which can be found linked in the resources box below the video screen in your webinar dashboard. Again, the code for CLE is 81577. All right, moving on. Uh, there's also a new notice requirements, and this is something to pay attention to. This applies to all employers governed by this new Chicago ordinance. And the reason you need to pay attention is we all know we have pre-adverse determination and post-adverse determination notice requirements under the Fair Credit Reporting Act when we run background checks and if we make a decision whether to hire someone or not. This adds to that. And what it adds is that in a pre or post adverse employment decision notice, you've got to include the reason for the disqualification. The pre decision notice must also include a copy of the conviction record and an explanation of the individual's right to respond before the decision becomes final. And the post decision notice has to inform the individual the process for challenging the determination or asking the employer to reconsider its decision and it has to advise the individual he has the right, he or she has the right to file a charge with the Chicago Commission on Human Relations. And so this is important to the extent you've got these notices pre-drafted or templates of them that you're using for your background checks generally, make sure for Chicago positions that you are, you are modifying to be compliant with this ordinance. All right, so this one, I, I I remember back in 2019, 18 or 19, I was talking about this brand new law that we are seeing class actions filed everywhere, uh, the Biometric Information Privacy Act, BIPA. And as many of you know, because you've, you've potentially had to deal with BIPA claims in the past five, six years, you know, we've had hundreds and hundreds of these filed as class actions in Illinois. Well. I want to tell you about this, this new law, the same as I talked about BIPA five years ago. Um, there's this new law, and what we've seen is we've seen 60 class actions filed on it in Illinois since uh, September of 2020, 2020, 2023. And it's something that everybody needs to be aware of because, you know, I'm going to go through the requirements of what this law requires, and you're going to immediately say this doesn't apply to us. We don't we don't do genetic testing. We don't ask employees for genetic testing information. It doesn't apply to us. And before you click and go to that other browser and maybe just see what's going on in the Tribune today, who the bear signed or anything like that, just stay with me. Stay with me for a few minutes and 
I'll explain to you why you need to be aware of this, especially if you have employees that um, do pre-hire or return to work physical exams. So what is the Genetic Information Privacy Act? Okay. It's, it was intended to protect confidentiality of genetic testing information, identical to what the name is. And it was enacted in 1998 and its last significant amendments are in 2008. And you know what else? Um, what else we have is similar to BIPA is it's just sat stagnant. Nothing, it's not a law that people are suing under. It's not, we have virtually no case law on this. And right before we have these 60 class actions that have been filed recently. And you, as I go through the law, you're gonna see because it sounds like it shouldn't apply to most employers. What does it do? It prohibits employers and insurers from discriminating on the basis of genetic testing information, okay? Prohibits employers from soliciting genetic testing or genetic information from employees as a condition of employment. Again, like I said, you're saying doesn't apply to me. Doesn't, right? And even as we read this, this is the provision that every, is being everyone's being sued under. And what it says is an employer, employment agency, labor organization, and licensing agency shall not directly or indirectly do any of the following. Solicit, request, require, or purchase genetic testing or genetic information of a person or a family member of the person or administer genetic tests to a person or a family member of the person as a condition of employment. Again, Gary, why does this apply to me? Tell me why this I should care about this. And all right, well, here's the first clue. So it, GIPA says, uh, genetic information shall have the same meaning as this term does under HIPAA. All right, well, what's the meaning of this term under HIPAA? It includes, among other things, information about the, fa about the manifestation of a disease or disorder in family members of such employees. Okay, so genetic information about an employee's family uh, members. All right, so again, how does this apply? Why is this BIPA part two? And again, this is updated, update this since the last time I gave this, it's at 60 class action lawsuits that have since been filed. Um, and what are the lawsuits targeting? The lawsuits are targeting employers who, re, who require pre-hire and return to work medical exams at a clinic. So, you know, a Concentra, um, all care, whatever it may be, any type of clinic that you send your employees to or your applications for positions. And what these lawsuits are claiming is that if that clinic asks that employee at any time during that exam or even in their pre-exam paperwork that everyone's got to fill out when they go to the doctor's office, they ask them for their family medical history. Do you have any history of cancer? Do you have any history of heart disease? You know, those questions that we all see asked when we go to the doctor all the time. And the lawsuits are claiming that if the clinic asks the employee or the applicant any of those questions, that that's a violation of GIPAA and the employer is liable for that, even if the employer knew nothing about it, even if they had no clue the clinic was doing that. That's the claim we're seeing. And as I know in this last bullet point, you know, I've, I'm handling some of these cases. I've handled a few of them. And many times the employer is like, I have no clue what my clinic is asking. I have no idea. They could be asking people um, absolutely nothing. They could be asking them a detailed questionnaire of every disease their family member ever had. I have no idea. How can I be held liable for what they're doing? And again, these lawsuits, so here's how I describe them. When you look at what the intent is of GIPA, it's to prohibit discrimination based on genetic information and testing. It's not, it's employers asking an employee to fill out a questionnaire, the employer directly, you know, do you have any of these conditions that, hey, might cause my healthcare costs to, you know, increase or whatever else it may be. That's what it's intended to cover. I don't think it's intended to cover what these lawsuits are attempting it to cover. It seems like a real stretch to me I can guarantee you of the 60 lawsuits filed, there are 60 motions to dismiss that have been filed or will be filed um, because there's a lot of legal issues and there's a lot of problems with these claims. And it's gonna be real interesting watching how the courts deal with them about are we gonna see 60 dismissals? Are we gonna see 20 dismissals or 30 or 40? How is this gonna go? 
Is it going to go on appeal all the way up through the Illinois Appellate Court and the Illinois Supreme Court, the same way all the BIPA issues did when they were brand new and novel? Um, I think it might. I, if I'm predicting, I think we're going to see a lot of dismissals. I think we're going to see instances where the employer was more involved um, with those cases moving forward, where the employer provided the form or the employer directed the clinic to direct the information. I think those are ones that may have a shot to get beyond a motion to dismiss. And again, so here's the legal issues we're seeing in these cases and in motions to dismiss. Is the clinic an agent of the employer such that the employer is liable for the clinic's inquiry? You know, just general agency law, general principles um, of law, there's got to be a connection. If the clinic is asking for family medical history that constitutes genetic information, there's got to be a connection where the company, the employer knew or directed it, or, or there's got to be something making that in clinic its agent in order for there to be liability is my position. The other is, <clears throat> is a solicitation inadvertent? So one of the provisions in GIPA that all the employers are hanging their head on right now is it's very clearly says inadvertent solicitations of genetic information by employers do not violate the act. And everyone's saying, if I don't know about it, it's inadvertent. And so dismiss it court. Um, is actual genetic information being solicited? You know, in some of the cases in other states under the federal counterpart of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act or GINA, there's case law saying that not all family medical history is genetic information. That, um, for instance, diabetes type 2, there are environmental factors. There are lifestyle factors to that. Cancer can have environmental factors and lifestyle factors. And the courts are saying that some conditions are not genetic information because there is a very predominant uh, environmental or lifestyle impact on that condition. And they're dismissing claims in these other states on this basis. Um, so again, some of you are thinking, well, why are they filing all these then? This sounds like a real uphill climb for these plaintiff's firms. And, and I will say it's one firm that has filed maybe half half of these, maybe two thirds, I'm not sure the exact number. And I think what they're banking on is the penalties include 2,500 per negligent violation and 15,000 per intentional or willful violation. And if you're an employer in Illinois and you have, you've had, you know, a thousand hires in the last five years or 2000 hires in the last five years that all went for pre-hire exams or return to work exams, you're suddenly looking at some real heavy um, litigation and exposure if you're looking at 2,500 per person or 15,000 per person. That's what they're banking on. That's what they're hoping. They're hoping to have enough uncertainty about this that um, enough uncertainty that maybe they can get some settlements from employers or whatnot. The other thing they're banking on is we have an EEOC regulation that basically says if you're an employer and if you want to use this inadvertent argument that the request or the solicitation by the clinic was inadvertent, then you have to previously give the clinic instructions not to request the information, tell the employee not to provide it, or include this really lengthy statement at the bottom of the uh, of this slide on any forms you provide or to give to the employee in the clinic so they know do not you know, report on any genetic information. Um, so that is, that's what the EEOC reg. Well, the issue you run into is, is that really you can have inadvertent disclosures that don't comply with that. And so that's the argument. And it's an EEOC regulation. It's not binding law. I'm not sure if it's ever been challenged and upheld as being uh, a good interpretation of the law, but I can guarantee that there are 60 motions to dismiss on file or about to be filed in the state of Illinois, arguing that that regulation is not consistent with GIPA, that inadvertent, um, that those requirements, that safe harbor language is not a prerequisite to arguing that a solicitation was inadvertent. And we'll have to see how that all plays out. So what are the takeaways that uh, that you should be aware of 
as we look at this, okay? If you require a pre-hire return to work exams, make sure you're not directing the clinics on your approved list to request family medical history or genetic information. If you're providing a standardized form, make sure it does not include requests for family medical history. Make sure your clinic knows that you don't want them collecting this information from employees and, and or make sure any form that the clinic is using includes the GINA safe harbor language. So even though my position, my thought is there's a lot of legal issues in these lawsuits and there's a little bit of an uphill climb, I think on some of these arguments for plaintiffs, I mean, the things we have to keep in mind is this is Illinois. The plaintiffs attorneys, especially class action attorneys do very well here. So there's no guarantee how these courts are gonna turn out on how they're gonna rule on these decisions. And an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure that if you take the, if you comply with the EEOC reg, even if we don't think it's necessary or what is actually required, um, it's, it's, it may give you the protection to avoid seeing your name filed in a class action lawsuit in uh, Cook County in the next, in the next year. All right, so what is one more? There's one more I wanna talk about real quick and I know we're down to our final five minutes. Um, the Illinois Day and Temporary Labor Services Act. And what this law does is this law primarily focuses on staffing agencies and their employment of day and temporary laborers that they assign to customer work sites. It it's been on the books for a long time. There are some amendments that are controversial that we're gonna talk about in a second, but it's been on the books for a long time. And it requires things like staff, it, primarily governs the staffing agencies. It doesn't impact employers very much at all because it's primarily about what notice staffing agencies have to give, when they have to pay, all kinds of requirements governing them. The one that typically impacts clients um, that many people don't know about is there's a provision in this law. If you're the customer utilizing contract labor and your staffing agency is not complying with the Wage Payment and Collection Act and the Illinois Minimum Wage Law, there's a provision in this law that allows that staffing agency's workers to sue you for their staffing agency employer's non-compliance. So in the contract labor model, you may be thinking, hey, I wanna avoid all exposure. I don't wanna deal with this. I'll let that staffing agency deal with all the nonsense claims that always get filed. Well, guess what? You may see a class action lawsuit uh, accusing you of not paying overtime or not paying for all time work. Um, simply because the staffing agency vendor that you've utilized wasn't complying with the law. So it's a law to be aware of. Now, focusing on the amendments, these amendments went into effect on August 4th, 2023. And there's several provisions. Some of them are very controversial. We have an equal pay for equal work provision, a labor dispute provision, safety training uh, and notice provisions and enhanced penalties. <clears throat> and what are some of the new protections? Well, there's a labor dispute provision that says the staffing agency must give notice to a worker if they're to be assigned to a work site where there's a pending labor dispute and that worker must be afforded the right to refuse assignment to the client site. So if you are involved in a labor dispute, these con you may have an issue with your contract workers refusing to report for work. That's something to be aware of, especially as you plan for this. The safety training requirement, and this is gonna be a, a theme that we're gonna see in some of these other changes, it is now requiring the staffing agency to come to your work site to investigate the working conditions, understand safety and health practices in effect, what training you're giving the staffing agency workers, contract labor, the working conditions and potential safety hazards. And it requires them, the staffing agency to give you notice of work hazards that it thinks you need to remedy or fix. So you can now be at, at odds or in adverse to your staffing agency because it's demanding that you make changes for things it thinks are safety hazards because it's trying to protect its legal exposure by saying, hey, we pointed it out. They didn't do anything about it, but we pointed it out. Um, so that's, that's one that's been a little controversial that people are having to do deal with. Here's the main one that has everybody up in arms and everybody watching this. And in fact, there was a court decision on Monday on this issue that's really important. And it's the equal pay for equal work provision requirement. 
And what the act says is that it looks at the fact that a lot of these, a lot of the contract labor can work at the same work site for years and can work alongside the customers, employees who are making more and have better benefits. And it said there needs to be equal pay for equal work <coughs> for contract labor for staffing agency employees. And so this law says that if you're working at a customer site for more than 90 calendar days, that staffing agency must now pay the worker the same wages and equivalent benefits as the lowest paid directly hired employee at the same seniority level that is performing the same or substantially similar work. So you have an employee who's doing labor services and you have contract laborers doing something substantially similar, there's now a requirement that that staffing agency must pay their worker at the same rate and provide the same benefits. And as we all know, they're gonna to attempt to pass that cost along to you and, and cost you to go directly up. Part of the reason this is so controversial is because the issue of, uh, of the benefits, you know, there's a temporary regulation that just got put in place last fall, which defines benefits very broadly and vaguely. Healthcare, vision, dental, life insurance, retirement, is that 401k match? Uh, paid and unpaid leave, other similar employee benefits um, that these staffing agencies are required to, to provide, or they can pay the cost of the equivalent benefits. Now, the, the issue is the staffing agencies are coming to their customers and demanding all this information on wages and benefits for their, for their workers so that they know what to pay them. And we're going to wrap up in about 30 seconds, but I just want to cover this piece real quick. Um, what the questions are raised, it's very tricky because a lot of customers have disagreements over who is the same or a substantially similar worker. Um, some business models rely 100% on contract labor and they only have managers on site. Under the way this law is drafted, your contract labor is going to be paid at the same rate as the lowest paid management worker you have there and provide the same benefits. Does that include profit sharing? Does that include stock options? I mean, you can see the problems here about why this is so controversial and why there was a lawsuit filed on this issue. Um, the law is set to go into effect on April 1st, which would mean July is when the compliance would occur. One of the things that we are now seeing is um, there was on Monday a case a federal judge granted an injunction against the enforcement of this equal pay for equal work provision. So the Illinois Department of Labor has been prohibited from enforcing this. And the reason for that is they held that um, this law is preempted by ERISA because it's requiring staffing agencies to have different benefit plans for different workers based on where they're working. And it's regulating benefits in a way that infringes on, upon ERISA and territory that ERISA is intended to cover. So the argument is it's been preempted, but <clears throat> stay tuned. Some of you have already been in negotiations with your staffing agencies about how to apply this. Some of you will be in uh, negotiations soon, um, but keep an eye on this as we watch how this injunction plays out. And with that, we'll say thank you very much for attending this webinar. Uh, we hope you found it informative and helpful and if you have any questions that you think of after we finish here today, feel free to email either Caitlin or myself. All right.